Sebastian, it's uh, good to see you today. And let me jump right into the topic. It's your book, The Power Law. I would like to thank you for writing this book because it answered pretty much all questions I had for over 16 years. I started working with venture capitalists in Europe 2006 and back then I didn't know much about it and I could trace the history of venture capital back uh, to mid 90s or the second half of the 90s but not before and there were so many questions open and it didn't matter how uh, far I looked and how much I researched I didn't find the answers until your book came out thank you very much it's really great I love the storytelling I love the way you approach the topic and would like to ask the first question. What is your background that got you interested in venture capital? Well, I'm a journalist and a book writer. I've written five books. Um, some of these books have been about the history of finance. So I did a history about hedge funds called More Money Than God that sort of is a bit like this book about venture capital, just a different mm -hmm. financial specialty. And I'd done one about um, the Federal Reserve um, in the form of a biography of Alan Greenspan. So finance has for a long time, you know, been my, my focus. And I guess I combine the journalist uh, technique of interviewing people, getting access, um, hearing from the people who are really at the center of the uh, action. And then some of the historians training I had at Oxford where I studied, um, which enables you to interpret the past and to hopefully write uh, well about it. What I find amazing about your book is the way you write the stories. When I bought it, I expected it uh, to be like a, a science book. So a lot of facts and uh, a lot of uh, historical facts. But when I opened it, it reads like a, a fiction book. So you tell all the backstories behind venture capital, what happened behind the scenes. What is your motivation to choose such a, such a storytelling type? Well, you know, before I wrote my book, I obviously went and read the academic literature on mm -hmm. venture capital. And I found it quite, um, you know, obviously very smart, but quite abstract. And so there would be generalizations about you know do venture capitalists focus more on deal selection or do they focus on adding value to the portfolio company after the deal do they think about um, market size or do they think about founder quality and all of these discussions seemed less interesting than actually telling the story of real deals like how did apple get back How did Cisco or Netscape or eBay get backed? What was the story about Uber? Why did it start? How did it go wrong? Um, you know, I think the genuine reality of, of these companies that everybody's heard about and, and what was the backstory about how, how did they raise money and, and how did they get going? I, I just think those concrete case studies have more truth in them as well as being more entertaining. Yeah, it's great because it also gives insight into the decision-making process of the venture capitalists, of the real people behind the big investments and uh, the hardships and the challenges that they went through. I'm curious, uh, we are in the creator economy, so there is a, lo a lot of articles coming out uh, that we live in the best times and people should focus more on telling stories. <laughs> When I look at your book, how much time does it take to write a book when you want to come from the storytelling angle? Well, it takes a long time because you have to discover enough detail mm -hmm. about each story that you want to tell. And that means you need to go and see uh, as many as possible of the people who were involved. So if you take- Did you, did you really uh, interview all people in the stories? I mean, most of the people who appear in my book, um, I interviewed. Really? Not wow. 100%. There were, so there were some cases like Masayoshi Son, who mm -hmm. is quite a figure in my book, but at the same time, the moment when I would have got access to him was also the moment when um, his fund basically blew up. <laughs> and although I spoke to people who worked 
for SoftBank. Mm. Um, and so I was able to form a, a sort of up close understanding of how Masayoshi san operated. Um, you know, I didn't speak to him himself. So there are some exceptions like that, but in general, um, I tried to speak to these people not once, but several times because I would have a first meeting and then I would go back for another two hours and these would be long recorded conversations. And then I would follow up with some emails and then I would maybe do a Zoom call. And so it, it, an enormous amount of, uh, of interviewing goes into this. And that's why the project takes like five years. Um, wow. It's not that it, not that I write very slowly, it's that I'm very careful about gathering the facts. So let me just adjust it and repeat it. So you did really almost interview all people that you write about in the book for five years. That's amazing. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's my method. I did the same thing when I wrote my biography of Adam Greenspan. I went mm -hmm. to see the people he worked with, the people he was enemies with, his former girlfriends, I mean, everything, because you want to get a 360 degree picture of the man. I did the same thing with hedge funds in my book, More Money Than God. Um, and, and that's what I did with venture capital as well. Yeah, I believe it pays off. The book is fantastic. So as a reader, I love it. I like it. Um, when it comes to writing, what is your work process? I read about, for example, Stephen King. I have some books from Stephen King. And in his book on writing, he says he sits down in the morning and writes a couple of thousand words and repeats the process every day. What is your work process? I think with fiction writing, like Stephen King, you can impose a routine more easily. Um, With nonfiction writing, you know, there are days when I'm, you know, writing and I get to sort of the third paragraph and I realize I need to really understand um, some, some piece of data or something or some mm. historical context. And I didn't write anything else for the next day and a half because I've gone off to do some spreadsheets and, you know, really test what I'm saying. Um, you know, other days I can get up, hit my desk after I always exercise at the beginning of the day and then I have breakfast and I hit my desk around nine o'clock and I can keep going till 7 p.m. Uh, writing if there's no interruption. And I'm very comfortable um, with those sorts of long 10 hour days um, if I don't get sidetracked by the need to go and think about the facts. <laughs> if I've got the facts lined up, it's easy. <laughs> that's true that's true i believe that what, what what motivates you to choose that style i mean I'm, i'm still mesmerized by the way you approach this like a uh, like a fiction book and telling the real stories behind it what motivates you to get down this hard route yeah i mean i guess i got here slightly by mistake so when i was in my 20s i was the africa correspondent for the economist magazine And I was outside Nelson Mandela's jail when he walked out mm. in 1990. I was uh, 25 years old. I thought my career would be downhill uh, after that because nothing could be as exciting as uh, watching Mandela come out of jail. And I wrote a quick book because I wanted to capture the prospects for South Africa. I called it after apartheid. And that just took me, you know, three months to write. And then I wrote another book a bit later, which was about the World Bank and development economics. And that took me a year and a bit. And then I wrote this book about hedge funds and that just took me longer. It took four years or four or five years because I had to get the access to the people. They were difficult to reach. They were quite secretive. And also at, by that point I had moved jobs. I had stopped being the employee of a newspaper that would always be telling me, come back to work, come back to work. I was now working at a think tank, the Council on Foreign Relations, which was more generous with the time it allowed me. And so I had the time, I needed the time. I spent, you know, as I say, four or five years. And what happened with that book is that it was sort of the breakout book for me, that it, it was just much better than the earlier books because I had had more time. And it's a book that was published in 2010 and now it's 2022, 12 years mm -hmm. later. And it's still selling quite a lot of copies every week because people talk about it and they tell each other. And so I realized that in a content creators market where there are just lots of people creating content, if you want to differentiate and you want to create something that's going to be lasting, 
it's kind of worthwhile to spend five years. And so that's what I do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think when everybody writes and also artificial intelligence starts writing, you make you have to make a difference. And bringing the story about people to people, I think, is a, is a big differentiator that is really challenging for machines to copy. I hope so. <laughs> when I think about the topic, so I didn't know much about venture capital in 2006, and uh, it took me 16 years to gain a bit of an understanding of it. I'm curious to hear your definition of venture capital after writing these books. What insights did you get on this topic? I think the most interesting thing in a way is to understand, well, I guess two things. One is, you know, how do you allocate capital when there are no quantitative metrics, right? There's in, in public market investing, there's the price earnings ratio, there's the book to value ratio, there's all these different quantitative measures. And obviously with startups, there are no price earnings ratios because there's no earnings. And there's no book to value because there's no book value. I mean, they don't own anything. And so all investing is, you know, tricky bets on an uncertain future. But when you get to venture investing, it's that on steroids. It's <laughs> extremely uncertain and extremely tricky because there are no guidelines from, from the numbers. And so I wanted to kind of understand how you even begin to do that. And I think mm -hmm. I answered the question. I, I looked at the ways that um, venture capitalists deal with that uncertainty. Part of it is stage by stage investing. Part of it is uh, the power law mentality of understanding that you're going to lose a lot of bets, they'll go to zero, but you're hoping for 10x on maybe two out of 10 fund, two, two, two out of 10 investments. Um, and then part of it is sort of having discipline around your deal making decisions. Um, you know, Sequoia gave me a lot of access, and I think they are really the state of the art on this. And they talk about how. Um, they brought behavioral science into their process to try to allocate capital in a way that if you made the decision yes or no on a portfolio company investment on one Monday at the partners meeting, and then you were to see the same company as it were, you know, two months later, you would make the same decision that uh, you have consistency because there is a process. Uh, it's not kind of just whether you woke up in the morning in a good mood. Um, so I, I, I go through that in the book. How do you allocate capital at this early stage? And the other thing you know, I was really, really interested by is what does it contribute to applied science, to innovation, to economic development? Because there is a debate in the academic literature, you know, do venture capitalists create innovation <laughs> or do they just show up for it? Mm. And um, I was sort of open-minded when I began at the beginning, but... Um, I, I, I rapidly formed the view that venture capitalists are an important part of the creation of innovation because they sort of, they de-risk the act of entrepreneurship. You know, to be an entrepreneur is incredibly tough. You're going to work for a long time on some wacky idea that most people think is crazy because if it's not a bit crazy, it'll just be the status quo and it won't be different. Uh, as Tom Perkins and Kleiner Perkins used to say, if it's not 10x different, it's not different. So you've got to be doing something really new and that's difficult and tough and you know, you'll know you get rejection and your prototype might not work. You might not get product market fit. All of these things make it really difficult. But if you partner with a venture capitalist, it becomes a bit easier, right? You know, The VC will help you to form the company, help you to find the first people you want to hire, help you to find the first customers. Um, and if you really, you know, work so hard that you leave it all on the field and then you fail because some big competitor comes in and steals your market, the VC is going to understand that you really worked hard and is going to back your next project. So it becomes a repeat game, not a one-off game. And so I think VCs in these various ways underwrite the business environment of Silicon Valley where you know, failure is just a learning experience, it's not a failure. Uh, and you can have multiple bites of the cherry and um, that's how you do great startups. Excellent description. I work out of uh, Europe in Austria, Vienna and uh, in track development. 
So what you say is 100% right and correct. I think especially in, uh, in the pharma industry and drug development in early stages, even the big industry doesn't touch this area anymore. Their preferred position is a later stage project. Um, banks, private equity investors um, don't like the risk in early stage scientific companies and the only ones who have a matching mindset in my opinion are venture capitalists and it's good to hear hear your stories and uh, your interpretation of that the thing that i never really understood i mean when i was a student i'm now 48 and uh, it's back in the 90s so a lot of stories in your book cover the upcoming and uh, the coming of age of the internet which is really great to read from your perspective um in the 90s, I had the feeling that Europe is playing a big part in innovation with the mobile industry and also in the automotive industry. And suddenly, 20 years later, Silicon Valley uh, took over the scene completely. So I think everybody in the world now uh, thinks about Silicon Valley when it comes to innovation. Why did that happen? What is your interpretation of the reasons why Silicon Valley became, let's say, the center point of innovation in the world? Well, a question, I think we agree on this, you know, uh, big companies just are often not the best places to do innovation. And part of it is they might be a bit bureaucratic, but also to be fair to them, you know, they always have this innovators dilemma problem where you know a new idea is going to disrupt the status quo and if the status quo is your own product of course you have a reluctance to disrupt what you've already got and so there are tons of famous stories about this i mean you know xerox park in california uh, developed the computer mouse and the graphical user interface and a lot of the early ideas that then became the the personal computer particularly the apple personal computer but they developed this thing without commercializing it. Why? Because Xerox was fundamentally a photocopying business wow. and they didn't like the idea of a paperless office with personal computers dominating everything. And so they kind of just let that bunch of brilliant ideas go unexploited. You needed to take those great ideas out of uh, Xerox and put them into new startups like Apple for personal computers, there was a company called 3Com, which took the Ethernet invention for networking and did a whole Ethernet company uh, founded by Bob Metcalf, uh, about whom, you know, after whom more, uh, Metcalf's law mm -hmm. about networking is named. You know, Bob Metcalf was a scientist at Xerox Park who invented this thing and would have been happy for Xerox to commercialize Ethernet, but Xerox didn't want to. So he had to go off, start his own startup, get backing from VCs, and then he could do it. Um, and so I think what's happened is that, you know, for the period until I would say 2005, this kind of risk capital from venture capitalists was just by far and away dominated by Silicon Valley. Other regions had a little bit of venture capital, but it was nowhere near as risk friendly as the Silicon Valley kind. And it was only really after 2005 when a bunch of Silicon Valley companies took their model to China and then to Southeast Asia, and more recently to Europe, that real venture capital of the California type started to spread around the world. And now if you look at Europe, I'm pretty optimistic about the tech ecosystem. I think there'll be lots of great startups following the model of Spotify and so forth, because there are lots of venture capitalists trying to back them. And um, you know, we've seen it a bit already. Um, and I, you know, I think I think that's going to just, just grow and grow and grow because. Europe is fundamentally full of great engineers, prosperous consumers. It's a great market. So why wouldn't it rival the United States uh, if it's got the right venture capital to take the risk? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Europe, my, my perception of Europe was that we have great science and there goes a lot of funding into basic research. But when I look on the venture side, uh, I miss big funds. So it's, uh, I think still, there's still a huge gap to the United States, which brings me to the next question to your book. Uh, I'm, I'm not entirely finished yet. So I'm two thirds through the book. And there are a lot of stories about Silicon Valley, a lot of stories about Asia. 
And so far, I didn't find anything about Europe. Uh, why is that? <laughs> sure. I mean, I do touch on Europe uh, right at the end, but you're mm. basically correct that it's, you know, Europe is missing. And the reason for that is that it's not the place where the model was invented, right? Mm. The venture capital model. So I focus overwhelmingly on the US. I tell a story about why the West Coast overtook the East Coast because West Coast venture capital was more risk friendly. I talk about how the model was exported to China by the same people who had done it in Silicon Valley. So the most successful venture operation in China is Sequoia China, mm -hmm. just like the most successful venture operation in California is Sequoia. Um, and so it's the same people with the same lawyers and the same kind of structuring with equity option for employees and all that, which was taken lock, stock and barrel from California to China. That's why China became the you know, biggest rival to the US in terms of tech ecosystem. And then more recently, the model has been coming to Europe. So now Sequoia has an office in London, Axel, another American firm has an office in London, General Atlantic, uh, General Catalyst, I mean, um, Lightspeed, um, you get you know, partnerships like Atomico, which is uh, a European venture operation, but started by somebody Nicholas Fenstrom, who had mm. had experience of raising capital from the California players. You've got Index Ventures, um, which is a European American company. Um, so, so my point is that it came late, but now it's come and it's going to, you're right, it's still behind the US, but it's gonna catch up. Um, and, and the more you get a density of venture funders in Europe, the more options there will be for engineers who want to start a company and the culture of it's okay to start a company and you might fail, but then you'll have a second shot. That will be created. It's maybe not quite there yet, it's coming. You know, I was told an amazing story, Christian, by um, a venture capitalist in India. Um, and he got in touch with me after my book came out a bit like you did. And he'd read my book and he wanted to have a chat. And he told me that he had been an a engineer in the US. He worked for Intel. He went to business school at MIT. And he came back to India in 2010. And at first, when he did investments, the culture of entrepreneurship was not established. People thought it was weird and a bit dubious if you were yeah. an entrepreneur, so much so that, you know, if you were a company founder, you wanted to get married, um, your girlfriend's dad would probably block the marriage because an entrepreneur was a loser. And so this venture capitalist I was talking to was saying to me, at the beginning, he had to call up the girlfriend's dad and explain that entrepreneur does not equal loser, right? But now, 12 years later, he doesn't need to make those calls because the Indian culture has changed and entrepreneurs are celebrated. You can see this, by the way, in dowry prices, you know, the value of um, entrepreneurial husbands has gone up a lot. Um, I guess entrepreneurial wives too, but normally it's the other way around. And um, the uh, culture has changed because of venture capital. And my point about Europe is therefore, yeah, sure, the culture is not as risk friendly as the US for the moment but it's changing fast, it's gonna change more and culture does evolve, it's not static. Uh, absolutely, great stories that you're telling. I love listening to you. And it reminded me of my own history when I jumped into a venture-backed company in 2006. I mean, it was a Novartis spin out and the department that was spun out was built by Rodger Novak who later created CRISPR Therapeutics with Emmanuel Charpentier. And of course, went uh, to Boston then afterwards to really grow the company. And I think also got uh, probably venture capital money from Silicon Valley into the company. Um, it was 10 years ago about, I would say. Uh, but in 2006, when I disclosed to my friends and my parents that I now work in a company that might go bankrupt in six months when we run out of money, they just looked at me and said, why? Did you throw away your life and your career? And looking now at Austria and Europe uh, with the celebration of entrepreneurship, a lot changed in the last seven, 17 years. I completely agree with that. That's a great story. I mean, Christian, that you're, you and the, my Indian friend, you're telling me the same thing about two different continents. And it's great news that venture capital has spread and that it's changing cultures and that risk 
is now considered more acceptable. Um, and you think about it, think about an entrepreneur who is thinking of starting a company. And um, initially the worry would be, well, where do I raise the money? So the entrepreneur runs into a VC and says, no problem, I'll raise the money. Uh, and then the entrepreneur says, yeah, but how do I even like do the legal stuff of creating the company, incorporating it? And the, and the VC says, oh, I do that all the time. Don't worry, I'll, I'll sort that out. I've got a lawyer who will fix it. And then the entrepreneur says, yeah, but to build the prototype, I need like six great engineers who are going to join me and I don't know where to find them. And the VC says, oh, I have a Rolodex. Don't worry, I've got a network. I'll bring you 20 great engineers and you can choose the ones you like. And then the entrepreneur says, hmm, well, maybe, but why would any of these uh, 20 great engineers leave Google or Microsoft and take the risk of working with me when I'm a tiny little company that might fail? And the VC will say, yeah, it's risky. It might fail, but I'm going to tell these guys that if they join you and they do a good job, even if it fails, I'm backing other startups all the time and I will get them another job somewhere else. And I talked to Eric Schmidt once about his decision mm -hmm. to become the chief executive of uh, Google. And he only would have done that uh, if the venture capitalist was saying to him, jo uh, uh, Eric, if you lose your job with Google because you don't get on with the founders, don't worry, I'll get you another job as a CEO at a different company. Uh, that is 100% why Eric Schmidt went to Google because mm -hmm. he was already the CEO of another company. He didn't need this job, but he took the risk because of the VCs. And I just think that's super positive for applied science and innovation around the world. Now, I think a lot changed with venture capital in the last 20 years. I often thought that it is... Uh technological uptake globally come from uh, smartphones i mean just uh, to name it to name to name one from apple steve jobs which um redefines the way we communicate also zoom for example i mean we can have a conversation now in real time i think 10 years ago it was uh, extremely expensive to do that thing and when i was reading your book I thought uh, I asked some questions and started to mark the areas, the pages where I would like to ask uh, no more details, but basically it's uh, it's far too much. So there is so much great stuff in there and I'm so curious. And in 45 minutes, I can't go through every single story or we can't, could sit six hours. So I decided for a question that is what, in your opinion, when you think about all the stories you heard, what were the three most important defining moments of venture capital since uh, the term was invented? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would choose as my first example, perhaps, um, the funding of Genentech, the first mm -hmm. biotech startup, because this is when the idea of um, stage by stage investing was really proven as a brilliant idea. You know, before, anybody came up with that idea that you do series A, then you do series B, then you do series C. You know, investing in a company was kind of like a binary thing. You do it or you don't do it. And if you do it, you've got to write this huge check to give the company a runway for a long time. Um, and that's obviously very daunting because startups are so risky. So if you give them a lot of capital right at the beginning, that's so risky, you probably would never do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also for the entrepreneur, it's not great to get all the money at once because if you, if you sell equity in your company right at the start, a lot of it, you're gonna have a low valuation. So you will give away a very big chunk of your company, right, for, for the money that you need to have the runway. So it's better for the investor and better for the entrepreneur to have a six month runway at the beginning um, start off slow, take the biggest risks off the table. And only if you can get past those initial, what Tom Perkins of Kleiner Perkins used to mm -hmm. call the white hot risks. Only after that, would you go to the series B and get some more money and try and take the next set of risks off the table. So I think Genentech um, in the late seventies was super important. Um, was was that, then, was, sorry to interrupt you. Was, yeah, that really the, was it really the first uh, time this stage investment uh, happened. So now it's quite uh, 
quite normal, I think, to have a small seed round or pre-seed round to a series A, series B, series C. So this entire model was invented with Genentech. Did I get that right? Um, actually, so in my book, I described there is another um, case of stage by stage, which is maybe a tiny bit earlier, mm -hmm. um, which is the game company Atari. Um, and that was done by Sequoia. They did stage by stage as well. This is again the mid 70s or the early 70s. Um, so it's right around that period uh, when I think two ideas in venture were really developed. One was the stage by stage. The other was, okay, you're investing in illiquid startups. Mm -hmm. You can't sell the position. So how do you risk manage, right? A hedge fund manager can just sell the position. A venture investor can't. So instead, the venture investor goes on the board of the company and oversees the entrepreneur. And if the entrepreneur is doing something that looks like it's going to like blow the whole thing up, the investor gets a chance to protect his money by talking to the entrepreneur and saying, well, wouldn't you rather do it this other way? Um, and, and so going on the board and having a really hands-on um, involvement was something else that you know, in the 70s was developed in those two investments, Atari and Genentech. Atari was amusing because the founder was this crazy guy who would have his board meetings in a hot tub. <laughs> and if you wanted to invest, you had to take your clothes off and get oh, really? into the water with him. Uh, and luckily the investor, um, Don Valentine from Sequoia, had been a, a Navy water polo player. Mm -hmm. So he was incredibly strongly built. And when he took his shirt off, his authority went up, not down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he was able to do this investment and kind of like force the crazy people at Atari, not only to have great games, which they did, but also to build a, a, a profitable business, which they probably would not have done without uh, the investor's help. Yeah, Tali like uh, got me into liking computer games. So I remember in the 70s, uh, late 70s, when I first saw this, right. uh, this, this pretty simple game with these two bars going up and down right. and a square going left and right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it was so simple that you could be very, very drunk and still <laughs> have fun. And that's why they put it in bars at the beginning and it didn't matter how much you had to drink and you could still play. That's true. That's true. So the stage by stage financing is uh, one, one defining moment. What is the second one that you would uh, choose from all your stories? Um, I might pick... Um, the moment when um, Masayoshi Son invested in Yahoo. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, 1995, the first investment, but the one I'm talking about was his second investment in Yahoo in 1996. And what happened was um, Jerry Yang, the founder, uh, and Michael Moritz from Sequoia, who had done the Series A investor, um, took a meeting with Masayoshi Son who was this slightly sort of outsider character, a Japanese entrepreneur who had recently come back to the US and started to do internet investments. And Masayoshi-san walked in and said, um, hmm, so Yahoo, I'm very happy to be investing in Yahoo. Jerry, just remind me, who are your main competitors? So Jerry Yang mentioned a couple of other internet search companies like Alta Vista. Uh, and um, Masayoshi-san said to his sidekick, Okay, write those names down. And then he said, Jerry, I want to invest $100 million in your company. And $100 million was sort of 20 times more than anybody else ever invested. I mean, normal venture checks were $3 million, $5 million. $100 million was off the charts. So Jerry Yang looked shocked and said, well, that's very nice of you, but I don't know what to do with $100 million. Uh, thank you, but no thank you. I, I'm going to go public soon, and I don't need $100 million from you. And Masayoshi Son said, well, if you don't take it, I'll give it to your competitors. Now have a think. Are you sure you don't want the 100 million? And so um, at that point, uh, Jerry Yang said, excuse me, I need to go and talk in private. And he went off with Michael Moritz from Sequoia and they, they discussed whether they should say yes or no to the 100 million. And they came back and they said yes, because it was a kind of Godfather moment, like the movie, The Godfather. It was mm -hmm. an offer you can't refuse. If you say no to the 100 million, which you don't really want, your rival will get it and will spend it on advertising. It's a winner takes all network business, internet search. And so you're gonna lose. Um, and 
That was the moment that Michael Morris, who was diluted by that enormous investment, um, you know, understood that in venture capital, if you don't have a growth fund, you're going to be weak. You need, if you're going to be a series A, it's important to have the ability to follow on because otherwise somebody else will show up and do the follow on check and they will take most of the profits in dollar terms. And they will also take maybe quite a lot of the control of the company. Uh, and that's what drove Sequoia to get into the growth investing business later. And, um, and that's what changed the industry from being uh, the kind of thing where, you know, you back Amazon, you get it to a sort of valuation of 450 million or something. And then in a year or two, it goes public. And now, of course, you've got these unicorns running around, which are worth more than a billion dollars, and they don't go public for a long time. And, um, and we have a totally different tech ecosystem as a result. Yeah, it's absolutely true with SoftBank with the 100 million checks. Um, in Europe, I tended to ask for 5, 10, 15, 20. And I think with 20 million, it was uh, for a very long time the upper limit to raise funds here in Europe. When meeting with SoftBank, you get the question right away, what can you do with 100 million? So we need to stick more money into that company uh, because of the fund size behind it. And the challenging thing was always then to keep people motivated when you see the big numbers coming in suddenly from a few million up to over 100 million to keep them just going and move forward i mean capital can so easily become the major asset then in a company and the real technology behind it can shrink to uh, lesser importance did you get a similar picture or how did you uh, get the responses about this uh the, the soft bank model how did this uh change the companies yeah, I completely agree with you again, Christian. This is getting a bit boring because we always agree, but um, I think you're 100% right. Um, and the way I tell this story is through WeWork and Uber, right? Where, um, you know, so much money came in mm -hmm. that the money was almost more important than the business idea. Um, and um, that's why WeWork, which began initially as a profitable company, when they first did office sharing, you know, they leased space in a big office block and they did these short-term flexible work sharing um, subleases and it was profitable. They were doing a bit of risk on term transformation, right? They were taking out long leases and, and, and then having tenants on short leases. So there was a bit risk, a bit risky, but it was profitable. And then by the time they were ready to go public, which actually didn't work because they'd messed the company up so much, they had expanded so aggressively because of all this huge money that came in, including from Masayoshi Son, and they had been told to go bigger, crazier, faster by Masayoshi Son. And it was a disaster because they were not profitable anymore. They were just growing and growing and growing, and it was completely out of control. Um, and so when they went to do the IPO, as soon as they published the prospectus, analysts looked at it and realized that the company was absurd. It was losing money. There was no way it should go public. And they had to humiliatingly back down. So I agree that, you know, too much money can drown companies. And I'm quite critical of growth investors for not being more careful with how they deploy capital. Yeah, it's sometimes I think the thinking behind might be the, the winner takes it all. So go, go in, go fast, take everything and push all the other competition out with all sure. the side effects. What is your third defining moment? So I'm going to choose again. It's difficult because there are so many great <laughs> stories. And I, I might have chosen. Uber I agree to that. <laughs> we, we, we've touched on that. But I'll, I'll give you another one, which I think is sort of super interesting and super important in the consequences. And that is the investment in Alibaba mm -hmm. at Series A. Now, the story here is that there was a Taiwanese American investor called Shirley Lin, who was one of the, I think the youngest ever woman to become a partner at Goldman Sachs. And she was based in Hong Kong. Obviously she spoke Thai, uh, Chinese because she was born and raised in Taiwan initially. Uh, and she was doing banking in mainland China and around Asia for Goldman Sachs. But it was the late 1990s, the internet was very hot. She was excited about the internet 
And also there were all these Chinese graduate students from Stanford who were excited about the internet and they wanted to go home to China and do startups. And so they started to come to the Goldman Sachs office in, in Hong Kong and present business plans and Shirley would talk to them and she backed some of them. And then she heard from another Taiwanese American friend, uh, Joe Tsai, that there was this company in Hangzhou called Alibaba started by a guy called Jack Ma. And at first she thought it sounded sort of stupid and small, but then she agreed to go visit it. And she realized that Jack Ma had something special <clears throat> and that the business could really take off. And so she wanted to invest. Um, but the way she structured the investment, this is the important part. She brought in Silicon Valley lawyers who set up a parent company in the Cayman Islands, which meant that you could have stock options for the early employees of Alibaba. Now in China in the late 1990s, any kind of stock, any kind of equity was a new idea. The mainland uh, stock markets in uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai had been opened in 1990. So equity was new. Equity options for employees were unheard of. You couldn't even translate it into Chinese. I mean, I talked to Chinese American entrepreneurs who were kind of scratching their heads at the time saying, okay, we've got equity options, but how do we say that in Chinese? Um, and so um, Goldman Sachs and Shirley Lin invested in Alibaba in a way that made it possible to use equity options. And then Jack Ma used these options to hire world-class people so he could build a world-class company. So one of the people he hired was this guy, Joe Tsai, the Taiwanese American friend I mentioned earlier. And he became the chief operating officer and the chief financial officer, basically the chief operating business person. He had been to Yale Law School. He had worked on Wall Street. He was a kind of seasoned uh, kind of New York financier. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden he's working for this Chinese startup in Hangzhou. How was that possible? It was possible because he was given enough stock options that it was worth it. You know, he'd been making $700,000 uh, at his job before at a company called Investec. And at Alibaba, he was paid 600, not 600,000, but $600. And he took the money because he wanted the options. And by hiring a world-class operator like Zhou Tsai, and indeed John Wu, who was the chief technology officer from Yahoo, who quit Yahoo and joined Alibaba. That was how Alibaba became a world-class company, thanks to stock options, which were made possible by American style venture investment. And that's kind of the origin story of the whole China tech ecosystem, which has grown to rival America's. I completely agree. I think taking risk must be rewarded uh, for executives, for founders, and also for venture capitalists, I believe, when VCs or when investors, let's not call it VCs, um, don't reward the people operating the business, I don't think it will go anywhere. So I think it will, will just uh, stop somewhere in the middle and not uh, create this 10 to 100x returns. Let me ask you my final question uh, to you. You wrote this book, you spent five years on researching uh, stories about venture capital. You also looked into academia and read a lot of uh, books. Venture capital is often about extrapolating the past into the future. So simply uh, finding out what will work in 10 years, betting money on it. What is your opinion on the future of venture capital? Where do you see venture capital in 10 years from now? So I think there's always going to be another wave of exciting technology which disrupts things and, and that's where venture will make its biggest returns. I think the safest uh, prediction is that artificial intelligence is going to be a massive opportunity mm -hmm. for venture capital. The reason being that, um, you know, sort of deep learning neural nets and these big um, open source models um, GPT-3 um, from OpenAI and, and some of the other ones developed by companies like, like Google um, can be adapted um, for specific businesses um, and turned into business tools. But adapting them and implementing them inside the enterprise 
is really difficult, it takes a lot of work, a lot of expertise. And I think that's where there's an opportunity for venture backed startups to come in and grow really quickly and be incredibly important. And we've already got examples like Scale AI, which is a young company started by a very young founder, Alexander Wang. Um, and when I speak with the top venture peak players, you know, just in the last month or so, um, that's the thing they're most excited about, AI. I think runner up um, ideas for, you know, which could also be very exciting. You know, if quantum computing had a breakthrough, mm -hmm. that would be huge, but it's, the tech is still speculative. Um, in a different way, cryptocurrencies are very speculative. The tech is quite easy, but the, but the sort of the business model and what it's really trying to solve, what is the problem that it's solving? That is a open question still. So it could be a super exciting opportunity or it could be the biggest misallocation of talent ever. Um, but um, that's out there on the horizon. And then you know more than I do about um, biotech, uh, Christian, but it does seem to me that there is a confluence of innovations there around very cheap um, genomic sequencing, mm. um, the potential for gene editing um, and other kind of software driven um, tools that, that make drug development potentially faster. Um, I don't know whether protein folding, um, uh, which has been decoded by DeepMind in London um, with artificial intelligence, probably not immediately, but in a five to 10 year horizon that may turn out to unlock faster drug discovery. So I think there's a, there's a range of exciting fundamental kind of platform breakthroughs, which may translate into faster drug development, which could be really terrific. Yeah, this would be a great thing, faster drug development at less expenses. It would also drive down the cost for, for the customer or the patient in that term. Sebastian, it's really great talking to you. I would really love to ask you more questions. Let me ask you one final question. Did, is anything open? Would you like to tackle a topic at the end of our conversation? Or would you like to give a call to action at the end? I guess, um, assuming that your network is at least um, partly European, I think the, the call to action here is is that you know the European tech ecosystem is growing fast. Um, it's extremely exciting as a prospect and you've got to like keep on growing it. I mean, don't be discouraged by the current, you know, crash in um, public technology stocks um, because, you know, obviously venture capital is building companies on a five to 10 year horizon and what happens in the market one year shouldn't matter really. Um, and I think that if, if Europe can get a few things right, right, you, you need to make sure that there are no dry taxes on stock options, which is when you tax the, uh, the employee at the time when the option is granted. That is a crazy idea because the employee has no money at that point. It's just a piece of paper saying, if the company does well, you'll get money later. So you can't tax them at the beginning. And, you know, I think, bit by bit, um, European governments are moving to avoid that mistake, but I think that's important. I think favorable tax treatment for um, venture partnerships, they should be passed through entities where the tax, there should be tax, of course, but it should be taxed on the limited partners when they get the return, not tax on the partnership, because then you have double taxation. Um, I think it's important to invest in fundamental science. Um, and pretty much European governments are good at that and the European Union is good at that. But I don't think the European Union should be doing so much direct investment in startups. That's not healthy because it tends to sort of drive down the quality of startups. Um, you know, government backed funds don't need to be so demanding. And then that just has a contagious effect on the quality of the startup ecosystem. So I would urge governments in the European Union to be helpful to tech by backing fundamental science, funding PhDs in fundamental science, allowing for intellectual property to be taken out of government-backed labs and commercialized, 
having favorable tax treatment, both for stock options and for partnerships, but don't put money so much into actual VC funds. That's, uh, I agree to everything you say. So as I said before, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we think in the same direction. Sebastian, thank you very much for writing this book. I really love it. And I can recommend it to everybody who listens to this episode, buy this book to learn more about venture capital, especially about the stories behind it. Thank you very much for this fantastic interview. I enjoyed uh, listening to your perspective on venture capital and your stories. And I'm looking forward to your next book. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and, and good luck with your investing. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>